Now we will be presenting our guest speaker. Lisa Jander is a certified life and relationship coach, public speaker, and author of a book titled Dater's Ed, the instruction manual for parents modeled after the driver's ed manual. Lisa was the former director of Great Expectations Dating Service on the board for the North Oakland Community Coalition, has mentored hundreds of teens, and is the mother of two young adults. Lisa helps parents teach their teens how to date defensively, navigate safely, and steer clear of unhealthy relationships by using analogies between driving and dating. Lisa is known as the teen whisperer by parents called Mama J. And by, I'm sorry, and called Mama J by teens and young adults all across the country. After her presentation, Lisa will be signing her book at the table located next to the balloons over on my left-hand side. Please make a stop there. Everyone needs to know how to educate our children on dating. Without further ado, we welcome Lisa Jander. Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see so many parents here. This is great. Thank you so much for coming out, and thank you to Mr. Zinger for having me here, and Joanne for the, her help, and all the staff of NOVA. You guys seem to have a, a really terrific school here. You should be very proud to be a part of this community. I'm going to talk tonight about a very touchy subject, but hopefully it'll be some fun. Fifteen years ago, I mean not fifteen years ago, when my son was fifteen, I was sitting at the dining room table talking with him about his driver's ed class that he was in, and we were actually filling out the log book. Can everybody hear me okay? Am I too loud? Okay. And we were filling out the log book, and I, had, I sat in that seat next to him for many, many hours. Some of you parents can probably relate to that. And I sat there with him, and we were going over things like driving in a blizzard. This was when we lived in Michigan. Driving through the fog and the rain, parallel parking. All of the things that teen drivers have to deal with and learn how to do. And as I was filling out the logbook, he looked over my shoulder. He said, Mom, I can't wait till I'm 16, get my driver's license, and I can date. I said, excuse me, this is a driver's manual. This is not a dating manual. And he said, Mom, everybody knows that when you turn 16, you get to date and drive. Well, yeah, unfortunately for him, I never got that memo. But what I did get is quite a bit of panic because I started realizing that I had spent all this time preparing my son for driving, but I had done virtually nothing to prepare him for healthy relationships in his future. Whether that was going to be at 16, 26, 36, hopefully 46, I wasn't really sure what we were doing. I just had said, you know, we're not going to talk about it right now. You're not really interested. So what I did just for fun is I went back through this manual and I changed all the words driver to the word dater and it was amazing what popped off the page and it also a little bit terrifying. So I want to kind of go through this with you today. The book that I wrote, obviously we can't cover it all in a half an hour. It's 272 pages long. I have a lot to say. But we are going to touch on some things today that I hope will help you kind of reframe your thinking around dating. Dating starts long before they actually date. It starts with relationships. So let's talk a little bit about that. When I went through the driver's ed manual, the things that started coming to mind as I read through some of the chapters that they touch on in driving, boundary lines. Have you talked to your kids about boundary lines? Are they specific? Are they measurable? Are they solid yellow or dotted yellow? What are you doing about the boundary lines? And are you in agreement? Do they have hardcore measurable boundaries that they can actually use in everyday relationships? In addition to that, I saw things like emergencies and hazards. Salesmen versus pit crew. Do you think there are a few salesmen out there that want to convince your team to do something that they wouldn't want to do normally? A lot of salesmen. So how do you counteract that? Maybe putting together a pit crew. I talk a lot about that in the book. That it's really important to have a group of people that are trusted advisors and helping them stay accountable. The big one, though, that really hit me 
Was driving under the influence is scary. What about dating under the influence? Any of our teenagers going out with somebody that might be doing something illegal? Maybe drinking alcohol, underage drinking, drugs. I was on the coalition board, we saw a lot of that. So what are the dangers involved in dating under the influence? But the biggest question that I had when I finished this manual, and the one that I'm asking you today to kind of think about, is this. Who will sit beside them when they log the hours necessary to be a safe and responsible dater? Are you actually in the vehicle, so to speak, with them? Do you have the wheel? Do they have the wheel? Do they know how to use the brakes, or are you braking for them? So these are some of the questions that came up, and obviously it spurred a whole lot of thought process and then ended up in a book. And I'm very passionate about the topic, and hopefully, again, it can be some fun. But what we can learn about dating from the driver's ed manual is this. It's a very structured curriculum. What structure do you have in place for your teen's dating? There's an adult investment with rules and laws. And in addition to that, our teens log thousands and thousands of hours in the course of their driving lifetime to become expert drivers and safe, mature drivers. What are we allowing them to do in terms of relationships to learn about healthy dating? Very few students fail driver's ed. It's a fact but millions fail at dating. And I do believe that is simply because we just don't have anything in place. We don't have a manual, we don't have a rule book, and for the most part, with all the parents that I coach, it's pretty much the cultural norm is to deal with it after the fact. I'm very much about being proactive. We don't want to see teenage pregnancies and dating violence and dating alcohol, all of these things that we want to avoid, we need to be proactive. So the driver's ed manual is actually divided into two segments. And the two segments are this. You've got the head knowledge. So the kids go to a classroom and they sit there in their class and they take copious notes and probably fall asleep because it's probably pretty boring. But they learn about the laws and the rules and the signs, what, what signs mean and railroad crossings and all these things. And that's the head knowledge. But then we also have the emotional knowledge, I call it, or the applied knowledge, which is segment two. It's getting behind the wheel. So how important is it for these kids to actually get behind the wheel of relationships and understand what they're like emotionally so that they're prepared to know how to say no, know when it's healthy, know when it's not? So let's talk about the brain first, because the head is a very important part of the actual dating. And if you took one without the other, it wouldn't be effective. For instance, what if you said, okay, we're just going to eliminate any dating classes at all. We're just going to let you get behind the wheel. Whenever you feel like it, you'll figure it out. You don't need to go to school. You don't need to take notes. You don't really need to learn about the rules. How safe would you feel being on the road with all these teenagers that have never taken a class? Not so much. It's the same way if you never let them get behind the wheel, if they have nothing but street smart, or with um, book smarts, then it's going to be really difficult for them to get behind the wheel and understand what's going on with, with the emotional side of the actual dating. So let's talk a little bit about how the brain develops. I'm fascinated by the brain and there's been so much research lately and I want to share this with you because I think it's important in understanding how teams approach dating. And it's not changed over the years. What has changed is the technology that they're exposed to. So when we're born, every organ is fully functioning except one, our brain. Our stomach is digesting food, our heart is beating all the beats it needs to be, but our brain is not fully developed. Why does a three-year-old not babysit a one-year-old? They're not mature enough, right? A nine-year-old isn't going to be teaching college algebra. So if you think about that, what are we doing to make sure that we're helping those teens until their brain is fully developed? Allstate came out with an ad recently, and it's actually really pretty interesting. It says, why do most 16-year-olds drive like they're missing a part of their brain? The answer is because they are. Now, does that make them defective? No, of course not. They're just not fully developed. It takes up to 25 years, sometimes longer, depending on the, the person, 
to actually fully develop that brain. What does that mean? Well, the amygdala is the back of the brain where the emotion center is. That's why little children have live out of emotion. And as you grow, there's a synapsis that happens between the two parts of the brain, and it connects to what's called the prefrontal cortex. And that's where we, as healthy adults over the age of 25, think from. That's our risk management. That's the part where we can make decisions. That's why we supervise our kids, because we're helping them make decisions that they are not yet equipped to make. There was an article in, in May of 2004. It's a great article if you want to Google it. It's a, a really good article about what makes teens tick, is what it was called. And there's some really compelling information in there. But I just took a few excerpts I wanted to read to you. This article says, it seems almost arbitrary that our society has decided a young American is ready to drive a car at 16, vote and serve in the Army at 18, drink alcohol at 21, and the best estimate for when the brain is truly mature is 25. That's a whole lot of responsibility before they have a fully developed brain. So when you add that to relationships, it gets to be a pretty touchy subject when you're dealing with a very emotional topic and expecting them to make very rational decisions and they're not equipped to do that. You see, there's this brain gap. You might recognize, I don't know if anybody's ever been to Michigan before, but this is a famous bridge in Michigan called the Mackinac Bridge and it's under construction. And this is just an illustration of what the brain might look like with the, the amygdala on one side and the, and the prefrontal cortex on the other. But there's this big gap there for a long, long time. They might look all grown up, but there's a big piece missing that we as parents have to fill that gap. So what do we typically fill the gap with? What do we want to do to make sure that our kids are getting the information that they need, making the decisions that they need? I'm sure none of you here have to ever supervise homework. You never have to make sure your kids clean their rooms. You never have to do any of those things, right? They think all those things by themselves doesn't happen like that. We are with the responsible parent that nurture and guide and help our teens navigate into fully grown, healthy adults. So what do we put in that gap? Well, we put a lot of things in that gap. We put community members, anybody that's a healthy adult over the age of 25. It might be a teacher or any other professional. It might be a family member. A lot of family members pour into our kids and help them become the people that we need them to be. So that's a critical part. So the question is, why do we feel that in dating, we just remove ourselves from that gap and expect that everything's going to turn out fine, that they're going to figure it out, that they're going to, at some point, know the right answers? It's a very, very dangerous road for them to be on. Another part of the article says this. Parents and other caring adults need to be the substitute for this developing prefrontal cortex. So again, being a substitute to me means that you're actually going to take that place and be in there until the time at which you feel like they're going to be making those decisions fully and completely on their own. So let me show you something that I think is kind of neat. We were actually at dinner tonight and we saw a little Volkswagen bug just, just like this. How many, of you, how many of the teenagers in here would like to have a car someday? Anybody? Yeah, I love that car. Well, let's just say that it was an orange Volkswagen bug. That's what your dream car was since you were two years old. And let's just say, yeah, that's not it, I know, but why not? Let's just pretend for a minute. So let's just say you go to the dealership and you order the car. Your parents say, yes, for your 16th birthday, we'll buy you a bright orange Volkswagen bug, brand new. So you go to the dealership, you order the sound system that you want, and the sunroof, and the spinning rims, and whatever else you want, and you get the perfect dream car. But the car salesman says to you, well, it's not going to be ready for three months, so you're just going to have to be patient. Well, you're not patient. You're a teenager. So you go to the factory and you watch it being built. Well, this is exactly a picture of, of what it would be like to build a car. And the first thing they build is the chassis. They put the body together. So they weld it, and they prime it, and they sand it, and they buff it, and they put several coats of paint on it, and they shine it all up and get it nice and pretty and beautiful, just like you see here. So let's suppose you're not ready to wait. You don't want to wait till for three months. You want to drive that thing now. And you tell them to take this down off the assembly line because you want to take it for a spin. How far do you think it's going to go? 
And I could go very far. It's missing a few parts. You see, there are a lot of people in the community that are installing the transmission. They're installing the engine. They're putting the wheels on it. This car is incomplete. It's not defective. We don't know that. We can't call it a lemon because we don't know if it's a lemon. It's never been taken for a drive because it can't go there yet. Well, this is kind of what teenagers are like. And if you teenagers understand that this is where you are, and again, you have the potential to be an awesome, quote, vehicle, but you're just not done yet. You haven't gotten to the end. There's nothing we can do to rush the time it takes for you to develop into the person that we know you're going to be. So taking this car dog off the assembly line early is really not a great idea. Another part of the article says, when we look at what's under the hood, that the very last part of the brain to be pruned and shaped into its adult dimensions is the prefrontal cortex, home of the so-called executive functions, planning, setting priorities. Does it sound like a teenager? That's the prefrontal cortex. They don't do this stuff yet. Suppressing impulses. Any teens have problems with that? Weighing the consequences of one's actions. The amygdala is a great place to live. That's where the fun is. That's where the no impulse control is. But it also takes responsibility to live through those years to make sure that you come out good on the other end. So we're going to do a little bit of a jump start today. That's what this is all about. What I want you to go, go home with is a couple of things. I want to rebuild the framework of our perspective on teen dating. We have a cultural norm where it's just kind of driving blind, if you will. We don't do anything about teen dating until it's too late. So I want to kind of help you maybe get a jump start on that and start when they're two instead of when they're 22. Maybe that'll help things along. But I also want to give you something, and there's going to be a handout that comes around. It's a pink handout. And that's something for you to take home and deal with, um, do with your family. I would really encourage you to do that. Um, and that's what that's doing is really introducing a new starting line. You can start when you're nine, you can start when you're 19. There's never, to, it's never too late to start. The important thing is that you do start. So every family's gonna have a different definition of dating. Every family's gonna have different rules and boundaries. It's not my job to dictate those. It's my job to help you kind of build a framework around that and make sure that you start that process and open up the communication about that. You'll be really surprised. One of the things we did in my family is all four of us went into a separate part of the house and wrote our definition of dating and then came back together and talked about it. And it was amazing how different those definitions are. So how do you define driving? Let's start with that. If you look at any one of these kids and ask any one of these kids in this picture if they're driving, what do you think they're going to say? Yeah. Does it matter if they have a steering wheel? No. Does it matter if they can put gas in the vehicle? No. In their mind, in their heart, in their emotions, they're experiencing driving. And there's nothing you can do to change that. They want, they have that desire, and they're going to sit here and pretend to drive no matter what you do. But who is really driving and who isn't? How do you determine that? Well, this is how you actually learn how to drive. You learn how to drive in three different ways. First of all, by watching. You sat in the back seat from the time you were two year old, well, an infant, in a carrier, and you learned about things like driving when, when the music was too loud, and what does it mean to get cut off, and road rage, and all these other things that happen in, in the car. You learned for many, many, many years. And then you practice with supervision. Now, in the state of Michigan, it's 14 years, eight months, you can get a learner's permit. Think about that. 14 years, eight months and all these kids are out on the road, okay? But they have a parent in the car with them. And then at some point, you prove to your parents that you're mature and you're responsible, and you can make good decisions, and you get to go solo, and they give you the keys, and you get to get your driver's license. 16 is a minimum. It's not automatic at 16 that you get your driver's license. It's determined by your parents and whether or not you're responsible. Dater's ed is to dating what driver's ed is to driving. It's the same thing. You're, the kids, when I was a kid, I watched relationships. When I was nine, when I was 10, whatever age I was, I was watching other people's relationships to see how they interact with each other. 
And at some point, I went solo. When was that? Well, I'll tell you one thing. In between there, there was no supervision. When I was growing up, we didn't talk about that kind of stuff. So my generation, really, you, you pretty much had to figure it out on your own. So we really missed the piece about having our parents help us and guide us and make sure that we were making good decisions. So what exactly is dating then? Are any of these people dating? How do we know? Is it when they're holding hands? Is it when they're looking into each other's eyes? Is it when they're sitting on a park bench together? How do you define dating? If your 14 year old comes to you and says, Josh wants to take me on a date, what does that mean? Before we panic, what does that mean? So defining dating is really critical in a family. And again, making sure that it's your definition, not somebody else's. Because you want to make sure that within your family, you're all under the same understanding. So the working definition in my book and for the purpose of the workshop is simply this. And when I say simply, I boiled it down. It took me many, many months to actually come up with this. So don't expect that the first shot you're going you're gonna to get the right definition. But dating for me and for my purposes is when two people are romantically attracted to each other and spend time together. So based on that, I was able to determine whether or not my kids were mature enough to handle that concept. So if my daughter has a crush on a boy and he doesn't like her back, that's not really dating. If my son met somebody at camp and all they did was text message from Indiana to Michigan, they're not dating either, even if, if they're attracted to each other. So defined dating is really critical. That's where you have to start. When do they really start dating? I'll tell you when they really start dating. In their mind, they start dating whenever they want. It's that desire. And again, no matter what we tell our kids, you can't date till you're 16, uh, it's, you're, never, you're never gonna go on a date. Whatever you tell them, you can't take away the desire. You can't undo the desire. And that's what we have to address and, and face it. So let me ask you a question. The parents in the room, how many of you would let your teenagers do join a dating club? Yeah, one teenager wants to join a dating club, okay? Nobody? What if I told you, yeah, what if I told you that your teens were, and your kids, your students, every one of them is already a member of the world's most prolific dating service there is? School. Public, private, charter, homeschool, it doesn't matter. All a dating service really is, is finding the largest number of available singles and putting, to, putting them together in the same place. Do you think that they go to school every day and can find that? Absolutely. So what are we doing about that? Well, let me just show you a few things about their membership. They get on the dating bus in the morning. They learn all about chemistry. They never ever flirt, flirt or fool around, and they're pretty isolated, so they don't have exposure to a lot of other people. So you're pretty safe there. Another thing you're gonna find is that there, there's parental controls on all computers, so they're never able to access things that we wouldn't want them to access at a neighbor's house or anywhere else. And they're, they're not smarter than we are when it comes to technology, that's for sure, right? You see, our generation is the first generation that we were raised without it. My phone was attached to the kitchen wall. I don't know about you guys, but that's how my phone was. My parents heard every conversation I ever heard, I ever made on a telephone. I didn't have a cell phone. You guys have cell phones, computers, all of this technology at your fingertips, and you're smarter than your parents. So that makes it really challenging for us to help you in all of this. We have to really kind of stay on top of it. So when you see this sign from now on, I want you to think differently about your kids and their desire to have relationships as, as they get older. The school sign, you see them holding hands? See it that way from now on. And that can be a reminder, when have I touched base with my kid about how they feel about this topic? Have that be a reminder everywhere you go. So this is not the only dating education that they're getting. But we can't blame the schools. It is definitely not the teachers or the administrators' responsibility to teach our kids about dating. It's not their job. They don't have enough hours in the day. We have to prep and prepare them. But our students have actually given themselves a learner's permit 
and dating is on the fast track, and it's not slowing down anytime soon. What I knew at 16, these kids know at eight and nine years old. And I'm sure you can agree with that by what you see. Driving analogies teach students three things, how to date defensively, navigate safely, and steer clear of unhealthy relationships. It's not about whether or not they buy blue metallic paint. It's not about whether they have leather seats or, or, or cloth seats in a car. And it's the same thing. Our job as parents is not to criticize the person that they've chosen as much as the safety and coming at it from that angle and having our kids understand that. We don't sit in the car with them logging all those hours just to criticize the car that they're driving. It's all about getting them down the road safely. So when should this education begin? When do you think you should start talking to your kids about relationships? And my thinking is, being proactive, is that it's never too soon. Your opportunity is much smaller than a garage door. So if they're four, there are things that you can do at four to help them and nurture them along and, and teach them about what a healthy relationship looks like. So what I'd like to do and kind of close with is this. Um, I know we're getting short on time and I really want to respect your time because it is a work night. Um, did everybody get a pink sheet to take home with them? Okay. So that's, some, that's kind of your, your homework, if you will. You can, you can all do it independently and come together. I'd encourage you to get a pizza and talk about this, this information. But define dating. We talked about that. Really define dating. Start there and find out what your kids mean in this day and age by dating and what age they are. Map out the best route. Don't just expect that you can talk about it once and then it's going to be good. You want to make sure that you're talking about where you want to be in 10 years. You know, you talk about that with career planning. Talk about it with relationship planning, too. Because I'll tell you something. I've coached plenty of kids that want to be med students, but ended up either pregnant, ended up being with somebody who's abusive, ended up living in a, in a place that they never thought they would live, simply because they didn't have a plan. And if you fail to plan, plan to fail. That's how it works. Don't let them drive blind. Get in the car. Be willing to participate, but also be willing to let them have the steering wheel and the brakes, making sure that we're not taking away from them what they need to learn on their own. And then log lots of healthy hours. What does that look like? What's okay? I was talking to a couple parents at the book table earlier, and you know, you have to kind of figure out what's okay. And I'll give you an example, group dating. How many in here are, are supporters of group dating? They, you, they can't go on an individual date, but they want to go on a group date. Okay, let me tell you what I learned about group dating. Group dating is, and I'll give you the analogy, if you have 12, let's say five 12 year olds, and they say they want to go on a group date to the movies, that's where they usually go. What that means is you're gonna take them there, give them a lot of money, drop them off at the theater, they're going to go in and sit in the back row in the dark and know that their parents are going to show up for the next two hours. Not a bad idea, right? So my question is this. A lot of kids in our community got in a lot of trouble doing that. And let me ask you this question. If that, those same five 12-year-olds came to you and said, hey, Dad, can we borrow the SUV? We're going to go down the street about a mile, park in a, on a dark street, and we're going to hang out in the car, just the five of us, for the next two hours. Would you let them do it? No. They're really not learning healthy things about each other that way. So what are you going to do to provide an environment where your kids can actually get to know a member of the opposite sex without any pressure or stress on them of being in an environment that's unsafe? So these are some of the things that I just wanted to cover tonight. Again, I couldn't even touch on um, the 59,632 words that I said in the book. But if you're interested in the book or information on coaching, any of that, I'll be over there to talk to you about that. If you have any questions at all, my business cards are over there. Feel free to call me. That's my personal cell number on the business card, and I'd be happy to answer any questions I can. Okay? Thank you so much.